I'd like to introduce uh, our consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development, Sandy Newell. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm pleased to be with everyone across the state of Florida today to kick off our initiative that the Bureau is actually labeling, labeling Florida Libraries as. And this is the first webinar in the series, and it's Florida Libraries as Community Memory. We know all types of libraries across the state and outside of Florida are doing a lot of cool and interesting things and have been doing this for years. I mean, this is one of the things that libraries have, um, have, have been doing in a variety of ways. The purpose of Florida Libraries as is to talk about successful projects and even some failures and to share what everyone is doing across the state. We have different venues for you to talk and learn from other practitioners like those on the line today with us. Over the year, each month, we're going to have a theme. And today and for the months of November and December, <clears throat> we're highlighting Florida Libraries as community memory. And since November and December are holiday months and the times that families get together to tell stories about their past, it's certainly an appropriate thing to start off Florida Libraries as community memory. Just as a heads up, other themes that you're going to see in the future are workforce recovery, uh, libraries as learning center or people's university, Florida libraries as information portal, small business incubator, disaster recovery, emergent literacy, publisher gallery, and lots more. So moving on into community memory, Florida li libraries are widely appreciated as stewards of local history and lore. You're out there serving as repositories of a community's collective memory, in addition to housing genealogical centers, archives, oral histories, and photo collections. Library innovators are, capt are captivate patrons through storytelling, traditional festivals, exhibits, celebrating culture and myth, interactive programs, and lots, lots more. We will feature many ways Florida libraries are preserving, collecting, and sharing the memories of their communities. During these two months, with the help of library staff, we will host webinars like the one you're attending today, provide online meetings, which we'll be kicking off next Wednesday, next week, and share through social networking sites. Today we have a webinar that will give you a toolkit of ideas on doing remembering activities with seniors. You'll hear strategies for making a senior program successful. Over the next four Wednesdays, except Thanksgiving week, we'll provide opportunities for you to actually have conversations online and learn from each other. All of these are going to begin at 10 o'clock and will be around the theme of community, memory, local history, and genealogy. And I'll tell you the dates uh, at the end. But let's move on and let me introduce our speaker. I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker who has a long history of contributing and outreach, providing senior programs, and being active at the national level. She is a freelance consultant who volunteers to coordinate the Community Conversations Project for the Lee County Library System. And I know there are several people attending today from Lee County. She is retired following a long career in Florida. And I first met uh, Kathy when she worked with the Bureau of Library Development a few years back here in Tallahassee. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to Kathy Mayo, and I want everyone here to give her a virtual hand clap and thank her for giving her time to do this program and for her work across the state. Kathy, I'll let you jump in now. Great. Good morning, everybody. And it's a beautiful day here in southwest Florida, too. Um, and welcome to Sharing Memories. And we're calling this um, Using Reminiscence Activities with Seniors. If you're like me, you have to keep looking at the word reminiscence. I don't know why it's spelled that way. but it always confuses me. Um, I'd like to start out by saying um, that you have access to seven handouts, and I'll be referring to them during this presentation. We're trying to cover a fairly broad topic in a short period of time, so much of the information will come from the handouts. And I just quickly like to mention what they are. Um, the first one is called Reminiscence, Finding Meaning in Memories. And this is a really good overview of the whole area of reminiscence. Um, the next one is called Resources for Working with Older Adults, and it highlights some of the um, titles that I'm going to be mentioning today. And it's not, it's not in-depth by any means, um, and includes some items on reminiscence and memoir, um, some on aging um, that I'll be referring to, and 
then some um, that are just sample sources for readings that you might be interested in using um, because they tie in really well with reminiscence. Um, next you'll find a couple of sample outlines for programs that we have used successfully here in Lee County. One's on being an American, um, the other one is on letter writing. Um, then there's a list of some popular topics or reminiscence-based activities. And then 10 tips for successful activities. And I think this applies to most everything you do with seniors. And the final handout is some sources for stories, poems, photos, and essays. And I'll be talking about and referring you to these handouts um, during the presentation. And Kathy, I'm going to jump in. This is Sandy. Um, I sent these out via email uh, yesterday afternoon and again this morning. So for folks, um, if they hadn't you know, gone in and checked their, their email, they are in there and they are wonderful handouts. So I'll pass it back to you, Kathy. Great. Thanks for doing that. Um, feel free to ask questions during the presentation and we'll stop occasionally to answer them. Um, our objectives today are, one, to explore the topic of using reminiscence with seniors, two, to offer you some tools to help you pursue this further with your own activities, and three, to introduce you to some effective ways to work with seniors. Um, I'm going to skip to the next slide. Okay, I'm curious, who offers programs for seniors now? Um, maybe you can raise your hand or give us an idea. Okay. I'm not, oh. What does it say? What does is, what is this hand raising tell us, um, Melissa? Um, this is Melissa. It looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five. Five people have raised their hands, and we've got a comment. Um, somebody says, I have senior socials once a month. Great. Well, so for some of you, this will be sort of a new area. But for others, it's maybe old hat. And I'll try and address both sides of that, um, of that continuum. OK, let's go to the next slide. Oh, no, this is the, sorry. You had the right one, the nature of library programs. Um, as we know, most library programs for adults, um, the presenters share information through an, a lecture, um, and a reenactment, where they provide some form of entertainment. The role of the audience in these programs is limited, often to just asking questions. And this model works fine for many programs, but sometimes you want the opportunity for more participation from the audience. Um, adding reminiscence to a program turns it into a group activity, and the presenter's role really becomes one of facilitator. Today we're going to explore some ways to use reminiscence as part of various activities that we already offer to groups of older adults. I happen to offer all of my programs in the community, but this approach can work well in the library, too. Okay, next. We do have a what? couple of comments. Okay. Um, uh, Corey says uh, we offer things like Medicare seminars. And Lucia says um, we at North Miami partner with the Senior Advisory Board to offer health and nutrition programs for seniors in our community. All right. Oh, those are great. Those are wonderful activities. Okay, what is reminiscence? One definition calls it the act of recollecting our past experiences or events. But the other day, I, I tried this presentation out with a group of, of seniors that I regularly work with. Um, and I asked them, what do you think reminiscence is? And one lady said, it's when you start a sentence with, do you remember when, such as, do you remember when we would pile in the car and go to the drive-in? Or do you remember when we bought our milk from the milkman? So that's another good. Um, definition, I think, of reminiscence. Through reminiscing, we share our lives with others and remind ourselves of important times and relationships. Your handout on reminiscence provides a really good overview of this topic. 
Generally, in a library setting, reminiscence is an informal activity where we discuss um, memories around a topic or a period in our lives. For example, um, it might be a discussion of our first loves or relating the experiences of new immigrants or talking about writing letters, the pen and paper kind. Its value is a personal one for both the individual and the group. It's also an opportunity to explore values and opinions based on a lifetime of experience. For example, um, relating marriage advice to a young person, describing the lessons we've learned from a long life, or discussing our feelings about patriotism. These views and opinions are all products of long years of experience. Notably, it's generally not nostalgia that bittersweet longing for things, persons, or situations of the past. Instead, it's a more honest attempt to explore our memories. And there are no right or wrong memories when reminiscing. We all have unique takes on our past, and they can vary widely among people who share the very same experiences. Just try to get your family members to describe a vacation from your childhood or even the house you grew up in and you'll get a vivid example of this phenomenon. And as Mark Twain said, I find that the further back I go, the better I remember things, whether they happened or not. Next. Next slide. Oh. Okay. There are a number of terms that are commonly used to describe the act of recalling the past. They include reminiscence, life review, life story, life history, oral history, guided autobiography, and personal narrative. Reminiscing or recalling memories is the basis for all of them. So is this life review? Well, life review is a more formal process of exploring our past. It is likely to be an evaluative process in that participants examine how their memories contribute to the meaning in their life. In contrast, individuals who engage in reminiscence often detail the events of their life in more of a descriptive form. Hmm. Is this oral history? Well, oral history is a formal process for discovering the historical facts and experiences around an event, a movement, or a time in life. It involves interviews, that's the magic word, with persons who lived through the specific time or event for the purpose of better understanding that historical time period. For example, I was recently interviewed by Florida Gulf Coast University students for an oral history project of the pro-choice movement. Um, a popular example um, of oral history is from Studs Terkel um, and the many books he's written um, on oral history on um, working, World War II, Chicago, and other subjects. Some libraries are involved in oral history projects about their local communities, or they've participated as sites for the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. You'll hear more about oral history at the Join Our Conversation session on December, 1st, December 3rd at 10 a.m. Okay, is this guided autobiography? Now there's a strange term. Some reminiscing leads to writing memoirs, journals, or autobiographies. It's a logical next step to remembrance activities and one that we encourage seniors to take. Libraries, universities, and senior programs often offer writing workshops for people starting the process of recording their stories. One of the titles in your handout that's called Resources for Working with Older Adults is by James Biren, and it describes a formal process for working with guided autobiography groups. As you might imagine, this is an area that's also um, an academic study. So many of the titles you see when you're looking up guided autobiography will be more academic. <coughs> Next. So what value is there in reminiscing? Why are our life stories important? Talking about our lives is how we learn more about ourselves, others, the world, and life. Reminiscing is a chance to travel through time. In the present moment, the best gift you can give someone is to listen to them. And I'll say that again. 
the best gift you can give someone is to listen to them. You'll find out about the past as you hear about their experiences and discover some timeless insights and guidance for the future. Well, one value is reliving important times and relationships in our lives. Seniors especially take great enjoyment in sharing stories of their families and childhood. Reminiscing is a way to pass on family stories and traditions to a younger generation and to preserve family history and cultural heritage. In fact, we know that storytellers in traditional societies were older adults, the ones who remembered the past and helped the young to learn from it. I think if, if you're like me and your parents are no longer alive, you're probably kicking yourself and saying, why didn't I ask my mom about this? Or why didn't we talk about this or get the photo album out and look at um, pictures and make sure I understood all the relationships. Um, this is a, a real loss I have felt since my mom died a couple of years ago. And she had Alzheimer's for the last few years, so she couldn't help me with a lot of it anyway. But um, early on, we missed some of those conversations, and, and now I'm realizing it. Another value is helping us to understand our lives by reviewing where we've been. Um, sort of the, how did I wind up here? Reflecting on and assessing life achievements, reflecting on a time when they felt strong and capable, when they made difficult choices and overcame problems, or dealt with losses, can again fill them with a sense of power and capability. Recently, um, with that senior group I was trying this program out on, um, I asked people to tell me about what was one of their life um, the highlights of their lives, a life achievement. And one of the women said, I saved my sister's life. And her sister was three years old at the time, and she must have been about eight. And her sister had fallen into a, um, a watering trough um, where they had cattle. And she was just floating, lifeless. And her sis the big sister pulled her out and, and managed to save her. Another man mentioned that um, Building a church, he was a contractor. Building a church in Minot, Minnesota was, was a high point in his life. So people have these, these moments in our lives, and um, it, it's good to share them. Rediscovering the expectant joy of our youth when all things were possible. Next. So who benefits from reminiscing? Well, Older adults are one of the main groups. Reminiscing is especially effective with seniors who are at a point where they are ready to reflect on their past. Their lives are becoming smaller and they have time to look back. Another group are intergenerational groups, be they family or just interested strangers. They are joined by a common interest in learning from each other. The Legacy Project um, with the website there is one place to find helpful tools for this type of intergenerational exploration. Next. Okay, in Lee County, I'm working with seniors in the community who live in assisted living facilities and retirement communities. Just to clarify, assisted living refers to residential facilities where staff provide assistance with activities of daily living such as grooming, bathing, housekeeping, and medicated, medicating. Um, that term, activities of daily living, um, is the basis for a lot of um, insurance coverage and um, definitions in the aging community. So you'll become familiar with it if you aren't already. We also work with seniors who attend adult daycare and congregate meal programs. Adult daycare centers, um, are defined as offering structured programs with stimulating activities for people who often have physical or emotional disabilities. My seniors are mainly in their 80s and 90s and old enough to have outlived their spouses and friends. The majority of them are women, which should be expected since we live longer than most men. Many are in the early stages of memory loss or experience some form of dementia. Um, and this only becomes an issue when people have difficulty focusing on a discussion. Almost all of them have a hearing loss 
and use walkers or wheelchairs to get around. Consequently, most of them can't get to a library easily, but they were active readers and library users in the past. I'd like to mention one of the books that's in your handouts. Uh, it's by Wendy Lusbader. I guess I want to mention more than one of her books. It's in the, the handout that's called Resources for Working with Older Adults. Um, she has some real insights into the life of older people. Counting on Kindness, her book, um, describes the dependence that people encounter, especially when they live in residential facilities. And one of my favorites of her books is called What's Worth Knowing. And this is based on Wendy's interviews with all kinds of older adults, people that she'd find on the subway or um, at a potluck or wherever. And she asked them some really important questions. Um, what, do you, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were young? What advice would you give a young person just starting out in life? And has anyone in your life taught you a valuable lesson? And what was that lesson? If you could live your life over again, what would you do differently? What would you keep the same? Asking these questions because you genuinely care about the answers may lead you to more that is really worth knowing. And this is a great book um, to learn more about what it's like to be an older adult. It obviously, particularly today, there's um, bukus of, of books on aging, but I really like the ones that Wendy has shared with us. Although I'm talking about using reminiscence as an outreach activity, it can clearly be valuable in a library setting as well. In that case, the participants might be a bit younger and in better physical shape. The discussions might be somewhat different, too. The topics and conversations, however, will sound much the same. Next slide. So what does reminiscence look like? There are some good tips in the reminiscence handout, and I've seen many lists of provocative questions for engendering thoughtful responses. Bob Green's book, To Our Children's Children, is a good example, and it's listed in your handouts. Typical conversations focus on a theme and elicit responses about feelings as well as past events. The questions that promote discussion are generally open-ended. Recently, we asked seniors about their family's holiday traditions, Halloween traditions. What was your favorite costume? How did it feel to be scared? Did you ever pull tricks, and what were they? What do you think of today's cautions about trick-or-treating? Do you believe in ghosts? If you ask follow-up questions, you can get at details and feelings. And I would say don't avoid all controversial or uncomfortable topics. Um, obviously, these are people who have outlived their, their spouses often and their best friends. When we talk about best friends and friendship, we'll just say, you know, I'm amazed at you all because you have lost some of the, the key people in your life and yet you've moved into an assisted living facility and lo and behold, you've met all these new friends. You are really strong people um, because probably when you were younger, you never thought that would happen. And here you are, you're doing just fine and you've met some great people. Um, people will sometimes surprise you with their responses. When we were talking about why we moved to Florida, one woman told us that her husband was having an affair with the boss's wife and they got transferred to Fort Myers. Well, no one in the room batted an eye. I was the only one who sort of, oh, oh really? Um, but people tend to lose their, um, the, the tactfulness in their lives and they, um, they no longer worry about polite conventions that perhaps guided them when they were younger. I'm pulling out a book by Howard Thorsheim, and he talks about some of the, the tactics that work with him. And he calls it story listening, <laughs> another way of saying active listening. And that this is how he gets reminiscence going. He repeats short summaries of what the person has said. Um, 
For example, I hear you saying that you like it when others learn your name. Um, he asks lots of open-ended questions and tries to do follow-ups like, would you say more about that or tell me more? I'm really interested in what you just said. Um, he reflects on feelings. For example, saying things that, that really sounds like a happy time for you. Get people to, um, to open up and, and share their feelings. Um, and if necessary, ask for more details. Use a combination of questions that get at all the senses. For example, what was it like when everyone was a smoker and you had trouble escaping the smell? What do you think of when you hear a train coming down the tracks? Well, trains are a vital part of a lot of people's lives, and this one question can get them thinking about um, that sound and what it meant when they heard the trains. What did your mom smell like? Oh gosh, I've gotten some wonderful responses to that question. Oh, she always smelled like um, what dinner was going to be in a few minutes. or. Um, I knew what she had done by the way she smelled. She'd been um, scrubbing pots and pans, or she'd been uh, picking flowers, or working in the garden. Group size and location um, can change how we, um, how our group works. I get the best discussions um, from group, groups of six to ten people. Since most everyone has some degree of hearing loss, we try to sit close together and ask people where they can hear the best. I prefer a small room with a door as to cut down on outside noise. You don't always have a choice, however, and I run some groups in hallways or open rooms. Activity directors um, will want to send more people, so we have to explain about the value of a smaller group where everyone gets to talk. The members of the group should be seniors who are able to participate fully and show an interest in being involved. Not everyone wants to share their memories or opinions or is capable of doing so, but there's always a number of people who are hungry for an engaging conversation. Next. Reminiscence really is more than, tell me about your life and we look to readings and props to help elicit responses. In his book, Reminiscing Together, Howard Thorsheim says that our senses are the building blocks of memory. Incorporating multi-sensory experiences in our discussions adds an important element to the activity and helps people to recall experiences and past events. Whether it's a pile of trunks and baskets from immigrants coming to Ellis Island, women building bombers during World War II, or Florida tourist flyers. They each help engage people for the discussion that follows. And I, I want to say that um, perhaps this picture of the baskets in the trunks has elicited more responses than any other photograph I've used. Um, I asked people, what do you think people brought in those trunks? Because they were limited on what they could bring with them in the steamship that took them across the Atlantic, and they'll come up with wonderful um, suggestions. And then I say, what would you have brought with you? And we just go from there, but it's, it's the picture that gets the memories going. Um, next slide. Photos can often remind us of experiences in our lives like nothing else can. They might be of events, scenes, people, or specific objects. It's helpful if you notice the details in the picture, like the expression on people's faces, where the event might have happened, or what time of day or year it might have been. I've used many family photos like these of my parents' wedding in 1939, or my son's 70 years later. My mom is wearing red in the second picture. People are very interested in your life, so that's another reason for sharing your photos. Ads, flyers, and postcards. Well, the internet is full of old advertisements that help tell the story of an earlier time. For example, we use ads for typewriters, telephones, and cameras when we talk about changes in technology. Flyers, such as the Florida tourist ones, help us remember early vacations. 
postcards make a great discussion topic all in their themselves. This one is a picture of my mom, who's on the left, and her friends in the 1930s in Miami Beach. Um, movie and TV clips. <laughs> I haven't done much with short movie, TV, and YouTube clips, but they can work well to start the story. Seniors already watch hours of TV, so be selective in the moments that you share. I often bring in big wall maps to help people identify their hometowns, where their ancestors came from, or the vacation spots that they visited. Next. Well, if Cole Porter, Nat King Cole, and Elvis can't help you recreate an earlier time, no one can. Music can set the mood as people enter the room or serve as a focal point for a discussion on topics like dancing, dating, and old movies. Songs may bring to mind people you were with or what you were doing when you heard them before. Of course, um, in a few years, it will be Black Sabbath, The Beatles, and Joan Baez, but right now it's um, music from an earlier era. Old radio shows are pretty wonderful. Um, most seniors listen to favorite radio shows like Jack Benny, Edward R. Murrow, or, radio, or Lux Radio Theater. Use recordings of them to create a program or just to trigger a memory. Um, voices of famous people. This is, this is really interesting. When you hear Eleanor Roosevelt, Martin Luther King Jr., or Lowell Thomas, it takes you to another time. Share clips of their speeches or, sh or their news shows. Um, Kathy, um, Kathy, uh -huh. I'm going to jump in. This is Sandy. We had a nice uh, uh, tip in chat. Uh, Rebecca says, I'm a musician and I get great responses when I play TV theme songs at assisted living homes. I love it. I'm writing that down. <laughs> TV theme shows. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, nature sounds are pretty great, too. Bringing sounds to mind can transport us to a favorite place or setting. They also may be sounds of the country with barn animals or city sounds with the noise of subways or horns and busy streets. Um, next. Next slide. Okay, aroma and taste. The beauty and richness of our memories is very often tied to aromas, fragrances, and flavors. The smells of fresh baked bread, a roast in the oven, or brewing coffee make our mouths water and remind us of sharing meals with family and friends. A sniff of white shoulders perfume always makes me think of my mom and her special scent. But there's also the smells of fresh mown grass, pipe tobacco, old spice, or mothballs. Use the memory of scents to help people describe people and events. Bring some with you and pass them around and, and just take some time sniffing and, um, and then recalling what it brings to mind. Touch is another important um, trigger. What memory comes from touching sand, a furry kitten, starched cloth, or an ear of corn? This is called haptic memory, H-A-P-T-I-C. Um, and it can bring to mind favorite things that you might have felt when I bring in my dad's Seminole Indian jacket, people admire its colors and workmanship, but they reach out to touch it and they pass their fingers over the design. The jaunty woolen bathing suit invites you to touch its roughness. Next. So who should do this kind of activity? You know, our role varies depending on the type of activity that we're providing. The primary one is facilitator where we are called on to listen well, start and direct conversations, handle logistics, and summarize discussions. When we are presenters, we are responsible for the entire activity and its content. We can also function as storytellers, entertainers, and readers, performers. Typically for us, though, library staff are the facilitators. It doesn't have to mean a librarian, but it should be someone who relates well with older adults. This is also an excellent activity for involving volunteers, especially retired people who are looking for meaningful ways to use their skills and experience. 
In the project I coordinate, I look for friendly people who are genuinely interested in others. They're flexible and open to all points of view. They enjoy reading and are good listeners. We also offer volunteers both formal and informal training and a training manual. And I'll just mention here that if, if you'd like to know more about the training we do with volunteers, just get in touch with me. I'd be happy to share information about that. Um, these here are three volunteers who represent a range of backgrounds. Brendan is an actor. Um, Catherine is a massage therapist, and Carolyn is a retired letter carrier. Okay, I'm curious, is anyone using volunteers to help with programming? I find that sometimes um, we really limit our idea of volunteers as being um, people who shelve books or run book sales, but so many of us you know, have grown up um, with pretty full lives and we've got some great skills and this is one way um, to use that. Oh, Kathy, we've got two people that have raised their hands. Rachel and Haley have said that they um, use volunteers. Great. And um, Rand says we use volunteers to teach basic computer classes. Cool. Well, let's go to the next slide. Reminiscence is an important component for many different types of activities. Um, Literature-based discussions are a natural fit that leads logically to writing and journalism. journaling. Um, Bifocal kits utilize a variety of approaches, and senior storytelling adds the performance element. Next slide. Community Conversations is the name for the Lee County Project that offers stimulating activities with thoughtful discussion to seniors in assisted living facilities and adult daycare programs. We train volunteers to facilitate the monthly discussions with small groups of seniors. We're not there to entertain, but to engage people in sharing their memories, offering advice and ideas. Typical activities include thematic discussions using essays, short stories, poetry, and humor. Participants get their own large print copies of the readings. And since many seniors have vision problems, it's important to put everything in large print with a clean font. So I, I generally do everything in like 18 point type. Your handout um, includes sample outlines for two topics. In the first, being an American, we discuss our countries of origin, the circumstances that led our ancestors to America, and experiences at Ellis Island. We read an essay by Colin Powell, as well as poems and writings by Barbara Kingsolver and Andy Rooney. Many of the seniors are first and second generation Americans, and they offer their stories of immigration and assimilation. The second theme, letter writing, explores that lost art of handwritten letters. We read essays about letter writing and actual letters from many sources and times that include personal correspondence as well as famous missives. One of your handouts lists some of our most successful topics. Probably the most popular of these have been love in all its forms, marriage advice from experts, and the seniors are the experts I'm talking about, and poetry. Not every topic works well with each group. You really have to tailor them for your specific audience. But I think this would give you a, an idea of some topics that, um, where you can find lots of readings and um, make some good connections. Next slide. We've got some comments. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, Lucia from uh, North Miami says, the Friends are great volunteers in our program. They lead oh, yes. discussions and also provide support in our children's programs and homework assistance. Thank you. And Isabel says, um, I also have teen volunteers that teach basic computer skills to older adults. Oh, that's great. Talk about intergenerational. I love it. <laughs> okay. People and Stories is a formal discussion program that started in 1986 
um, it was started to engage new Americans with literature. It's since been used with a variety of groups, including older adults. Um, the way it works is facilitators read short stories aloud and participants follow along with their own copies. The discussions that follow focus on five key elements of each piece. And the terms they use are poetics, shadows, tensions, issues, and experiences. Um, people in stories have an excellent choice of stories, and it's a real plus. And they can easily incorporate reminiscence into their discussions by stressing personal experiences and reactions um, and description. I, we originally started our program by doing a lot of training in people in stories, but we realized that a lot of the stories were too old for, uh, too long for the groups that I use. But the techniques that they discuss are really important. And you might want to go to their website, peopleandstories.org, to find out more about this kind of activity. Hope discussion groups are nothing new to libraries, but they can take on a fresh look when we add reminiscence to the mix. The choice of titles is key to reaching many older adults. I recommend collections of essays from This I Believe, interviews from the StoryCorps books, and other collections of short pieces. Participants can read the essays and that they enjoy without feeling obligated to finish the whole book. And some of them um, get turned off by different essays, and I say, oh, well, then just skip that one and go to the next one. And so um, when we have a discussion, we can pull out the ones that we like, read them out loud, and they're short enough that, um, that they fit into the format really well. Humorous memoirs like Bill Bryson's The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid give seniors a chance to share their memories of the 1950s. And this is a great title. I use it a lot. I, I use his description of potluck suppers in the 50s and um, driving court cross country um, in a non-air conditioned car in the 50s. And, um, these are all things that people can relate to pretty well. Next slide. Many libraries um, produce readers theater programs as a form of entertainment for different audiences. And Reader's Theater, it's an oral interpretation of a piece of literature read in a dramatic style. It generally features two or three animated readers who read short pieces that focus on a single theme, usually mixed with humor. Um, typical topics include communication and miscommunication, family life, married life, and mothers. Audience feedback allows for seniors to participate through recalling their own experiences. So this is a good way to start a discussion um, using Reader's Theater. I also wanted to, um, to use it with some of our groups. I haven't done this yet. Um, by giving them some readings that they can, uh, so they can present a Reader's Theater to the residents where they live. I think that would be fun. Writing and journalism, <laughs> I can't even talk. Writing and journaling workshops are an excellent way for people to record their stories, often at the encouraging of their family members. Facilitators help give structure to the writing process, and sessions often extend over six to eight weeks. Each week is a chance to share writings and explore a new topic, such as learning to cook, a childhood home, or money. Next slide. Bifocal kits are multi-sensory programming kits built around a reminiscence theme. Remembering is the first word of every kit title, and it's the focus of these materials. I'm curious, how many have used bifocal kits? They've been around since the 70s, so um, a lot of us have had a lot of experience using the kits. Each kit contains an AV presentation on DVD, CDs with vocal and piano accompaniment for sing-along songs, participant booklets in large print with photos, poems, and songs, skits or jokes, and a comprehensive presenter's manual. The kits have resources for a month of activities and are often used by senior facilities to plan their monthly theme. Um, if you're like me, you probably started buying kits 
back in the 70s and 80s um, when they were produced in slide format and on um, audio cassettes. And you might want to update your kit. Um, you can go to the Bifocal um, website and um, see about ordering the DVD version or the CD version of what you already have and just um, sort of give your kit a new life. When Catherine Leidy and Lynn Martin Erickson started their company after library school over 30 years ago, I doubt if they realized the impact they would have on seniors from around the country. We laughed that one day they would make a kit called Remembering the 60s, and last year Lynn did just that. Bifocal also produces smaller versions of the kits called mini kits, as well as downloadable resources, books, picture sets, short programs on DVD, and intergenerational resources. Check out the website at bifocal.org for program ideas and their newsletter, too. Um, next slide, senior storytelling. Um, while most libraries have storytelling programs for children, seniors appreciate it just as much as their grandchildren do. Um, there's an awful lot written about um, storytelling for adults, and I won't go into it much, but adding time for reminiscence helps seniors to personalize the stories. So leave plenty of time for, um, if you do a senior story time, to get the audience to take that story and personalize it with their own history. I want to mention a program that's, that's really interesting. It's called Time Slips. It's a type of storytelling that works especially well with people who experience memory loss. As you can imagine, um, remembering is, is sort of frustrating for people when they have um, some serious memory issues. So instead of focusing on what people remember, it uses photos as triggers to help seniors improvise their own stories around these visuals. Their internet site, timeslips.org, includes training and sample activities. Um, and if, I'm curious if anybody has used time slips. Um, raise your hand because I'd like to know, I'd like to talk with you and, and find out more about it. Um, it's something we plan to do this year, but um, I haven't done it yet. And, but it's, it looks good because I have a couple of sites where people are, um, they're an established group, but they clearly are forgetting more than they used to a year ago. Your handout, um, top 10 Top Tips for Successful Activities, was compiled for our Community Conversations Project um, and for our volunteers, but I think it includes some helpful helpful suggestions for any programming activity with seniors. Next slide. Okay, so most of, our, of the activities I've mentioned involve using literature of some type, so it helps to have the rich collections of our libraries as resources. You really don't need to go a whole lot further than your own library to find some great um, essays, poems, short stories that you can use in your activities. What makes a good reading? In my programs, I look for easily accessible pieces that speak to the interests of our seniors. These are usually essays or short stories of no longer than three pages in large print and poetry that we can read well aloud. I like to use a mix of readings, some that incite discussion or challenge conventional thinking as well as old favorites that we read in school. Juvenile materials are a good choice, too. Or how could you discuss poetry without a little Shel Silverstein or Judith Viorst? Humor is an important element to look for, and we try to have plenty of it sprinkled into each activity. Your handout on sources gives you a good place to start with online resources. Some of my favorite sites include This I Believe, which is a collection of the essays of personal beliefs from famous and everyday people. Fortunately, it can be easily searched by topic and keyword. Um, you may remember this, I believe, is a program that was um, started by Edward R. Murrow in the 1950s, and it ran for four years. But it was um, about 12 years ago, was started again, uh, first on National Public Radio and then on Cirrus Radio. And 
it's just a great chance for people to um, write out their personal beliefs and read them on the air. Um, they have a wonderful website that can be searched um, so easily by through their archives. And you can find great essays that you can use with any age group. I, I'm really very fond of that site. Letters of Note is a gathering of fascinating letters, postcards, faxes, and memos that can generate some wonderful discussions. Incidentally, this year many of them were published as a book by the same title. Um, I found some great letters in there that I, I've shared a lot with, with my groups and um, they're not always by famous people. Sometimes they're, but they speak of a, a good time um, or an interesting time in history and they really get some good discussions going. StoryCorps is the collection of personal interviews that we hear each Friday on NPR. That site includes helpful advice for conducting interviews as well as audios that you can use in a group setting. There's also several sites that will send you daily emails with poems and other readings. In your handout called Resources for Working with Older Adults, I've included a list of sample sources and authors for readings that you'll find in most public libraries. It's a short list, but I found them all to be filled with good readings. I didn't include the chicken soup books, but there are some useful pieces there that are hidden among their sentimental and nostalgic offerings. Don't forget newspaper and magazine articles. I'm always finding short pieces that I think will add to an activity, and I file them away for future use. Okay, here's the magic question. Do you need copyright permission to use these works in your programs? Well, clearly, if you're just going to read a piece to your group, that's not required. I try to get permission from the copyright holder for any pieces that I want to make copies of um, for group readings. <clears throat> and I found that many online sources give blanket permissions. Um, a really good source is floridamemory.com. Um, it's an excellent source for photos and other materials that don't require copyright permission. Well, where do we go from here? Um, I, Next slide. <laughs> I have given you just a, a sample of how we can use reminiscence with older adults. Um, but now I'd like to take your questions. Incidentally, this is a picture of my mom and my husband. And I've shown this picture at my groups um, in, in her later years. My mom died when she was 95. So when she was in her 90s, she and my husband became really fast buddies because he was the main person that took her to medical appointments and to grocery shop or whatever. But she wound up in an assisted living facility for people with Alzheimer's. Um, but they still went out every day and did something. And one of the things they did was shop for a sports car for him. But it had to be a color that she could see because she had um, very poor eyesight. So it had to be like yellow or red. And one day they found this red Miata that they both liked so they bought it and they spent the next two years driving around in it with the top down and he always kept her hairbrush in the car so he could brush her hair if it got windy. And even though she's gone, the hairbrush is still there and it's a part of the car. It's, um, it reminds us of her every time we get in the car. But any questions? Huh? Or anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, so we'd like to hear hear from the rest of the folks in our virtual room. You know, questions for Kathy or comments you'd like to add based on what you heard or what you're doing in your library. This is Melissa. You can go ahead and put those into the chat panel, or you can raise your hand and we'll know that you want to say something out loud. Either way is fine. I'm also curious about any ways that you'd like to use reminiscence in your activities. Right, that's what I was thinking too, Kathy. Lucia, go ahead. I'm going to unmute you. Go on. Oh, I was muted. Hello, this is Lucia. Hi, Lucia. Uh, hey, this 
one of the difficulties that I find in uh, reaching to and bringing together the senior community in reminiscence is that part of the, of the seniors in my community speak the language and have been here forever. They're generations in North Miami. And then the other part, which is a great bulk of the community of seniors, don't speak the language. And uh, they, are, they came here as adults. And so what I'm seeking is a way of bringing those senior communities together in reminiscing. Wow. Well, it sounds good. I bet I bet the people who don't speak much English um, speak a little bit, and um, I, I guess your role be also becomes interpreter if you do that kind of thing, um, where you can share the, the sp memories in Spanish with the folks who, um, and English with folks who speak um, one or the other language or both. Um, yeah, they, oh, I think most that of them come from, uh, from Haiti. From Haiti, oh. Yes. So do you have staff or, or volunteers who can, um, who can share the language? I, I have some staff now, uh, young people that speak both languages. Well, it sounds like an intergenerational activity right there, <laughs> with your young yeah. staff and your older people. Oh, I, I think that sounds like a, a really rich possibility. Um, I'd be interested to see how it works. And we've got I'll share with you. <laughs> Great. We've got another um, another comment here. Um, let me find it. Um, Heather says, lots of great ideas today. My community is about to do an oral history project in 2015, so thinking about ways to facilitate good conversations. Thank you. Thank you. And Isabel says, um, uh, thank you for all the great resources, Kathy. I'll add reminiscent activities to my senior social. Um, and Linda says, so much good information and so many I good ideas to help me move this project from we should do that file to the actually reach out to our community <laughs> to make it happen. Thanks so much. You know, we all have one of those files. <laughs> <clears throat> well, as we're wrapping up here, and of course we still would accept questions and comments in any way you want to give them, but Kathy, I want to say thank you so much for an interesting presentation, tips, and those wonderful handouts that you shared. As we just heard from everybody, uh, we learned a lot this morning. Uh, I'll wrap up by telling you what is happening next. Come back next week at 10 a.m. with your colleagues. We have sessions set for November 12th, the 19th, December 3rd, and the 10th. On November 12th, as you see, it'll be a broad topic, local history and genealogy services. Then we'll start focusing as we get to November 19th. And this will be centered around providing community history programs and cultural programs and more of that aspect of it. And then on the third, uh, we'll be talking about oral history projects. And our last join our um, conversation is going to be working with teams in intergenerational uh, programs. And our final, final session is going to be on December 17th. This one's going to be more like a webinar on creating your own community memory kit, Florida style. Now, the update on this is that these, oh, the next four sessions are conversations. It's not going to be a more of the wonderful formal presentation we had from Kathy this morning. It's really going to depend on the people in our virtual room. What questions you have, what we talk about, will, will be based on what you are interested in. And I do know <clears throat> local history it can be a very different topic from genealogy, but we're putting them together for our Florida libraries as community memory. So please do come uh, with your questions and examples of activities that worked in your hometown, just like what Lucia uh, shared, uh, what she's thinking about doing, and people shared what they have been doing and using volunteers and, and inter programs for seniors. Uh, we will, where possible, uh, use voices because 
this morning, for the most part, uh, we were listening to Kathy, and that worked out nice. Uh, but what we want to do uh, with the next uh, join our conversation is have a mix of chat and voices to, to, to liven it up. Um, so do come with your questions. Uh, I will actually open up the discussion by asking next week, what's one opportunity, challenge, or question related to today's topic do you want to share? So I'm very curious about uh, the folks who attended this morning on whose plans to attend next week. If you do, would you raise your hand and just give me a feel, you know, we'll get your registration listed if you're thinking about attending next week. Uh, would love it if you would go ahead and raise your hand. And while folks are doing that, and we can see if folks are planning to, to drop in next week, I want to tell you about our very last session. As I mentioned, it is going to be around creating your own community memory kit. So everything that you heard from Kathy this morning can inform you in how to put together your own kit, your own kit about your community, about um, certain topics. And what we're doing here at the State Library, our team is working on uh, Florida roadside attractions. And you heard Kathy mention the uh, uh, FloridaMemory.com is a source of lots and lots of wonderful photographs. And we're putting together something that would be similar to what you saw with the bifocal kit. We're going to have a PowerPoint that will be posted um, up online uh, that you'll be able to download. So if you want to present uh, Florida roadside attractions in your own community, we'll be able to do that. We'll have suggestions on the realia, the, the concept of maps, the brochures you actually saw that Kathy had. But we'll also, the focus on December 17th, we'll be talking you through how to create your own kit. And again, a lot of what um, Kathy shared this morning will inform uh, that program too. So do any, any questions or comments that anybody wants to add? And I know Melissa is sort of watching who, who might be attending next, next week. Yep, um, I've taken note of who's attending next week. Um, and uh, Ronald wants to know, is the PowerPoint available to review? I need to pre present some information with my supervisor. Yes, um, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to convert this recording loaded up on YouTube, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email in the next couple of days that will have uh, a link to the PowerPoint PDFs. Um, as well as the handouts and the YouTube uh, recording and whatever um, resources that we can scramble together um, that will help you guys out. Well, thank you so much um, for joining this conversation today, and thank you to the State Library for sponsoring this event. Um, I've enjoyed it, and um, it, it always helps to help you organize your thoughts when you have to describe your own projects. Thank you very much, Sandy and, and Melissa. And I would wrap up to give, everybody give uh, Kathy a hand again. <laughs> clap, 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 clap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's been great. We'll stay on uh, a little while in case folks want to. Um, oh, there we got a hand clap. Yay. <laughs> <Right now. laughs> Oh, one last thing I didn't say was follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I meant to say that. I don't remember if we had that earlier. There we are. Yay. This is Melissa. We'll stay on for a few minutes to make sure that we get everybody's questions answered. But thank you for being on with us. And we'll see you next week, hopefully. I guess I'm ignorant, but are there already a lot of um, of postings on YouTube from library development? 
Yes. <laughs> We've got a pretty good library of recordings. We try to, um, well, unless there's a technical problem, we try to get all of our, our webinars on to YouTube um, so that people can watch them. Because a lot of people may not be able to attend the live event, but they want to still get the information. Um, and Christine had asked if we'll be emailing our certificate of attendance. We don't really offer um, continuing I, education. But I could, we don't do units, but I could um, send you something if you want. Uh, if you would just email me with the request. And that was Sandy. And that, yeah. We, we typically don't do automatically send them out, but per request, I know it's nice to have things in your file for your, for your evaluation and your participation. <clears throat> What's fun now, I know what I should do is tell you, I'll mail the certificate once you tell me one idea that you're going to implement <laughs> or have implemented. <laughs> That would be really <laughs> But we'll, we'll just do it around the 10 minutes this time. But I might implement that in future <laughs> sessions. <laughs> We're always looking for outcomes. <laughs> and thank you, Kathy, again. That was a great presentation. I think you gave a lot of great information. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. We're down to seven people. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us once again, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>